don't be upset. So, so famine is a lifelong learning. No farmer gets success in every growing. We must try and then we must adapt and then we must learn something. And then, you know, gradually you will be, you will be a professional gardener. Kunia Oahu. This historic stretch of farmland located halfway across the island was mostly occupied by the Del Monte pineapple plantation fields until 2006. Now, over a decade later, small farms leased by first and second generation immigrants cover the landscape, some with lineages that connect them to the laborers that manned these fields hundreds of years ago. So our farm was started in 2016 out in Cunia. We have over 200 acres and currently we have over 40 immigrant farmers on our plot. Are you saw? Yeah. I saw. When we first started filming Farmers in the Kitchen five months ago, our goals were simple. To meet Pacific Gateway Center's immigrant and refugee farmers, share their stories and learn more about their culture through the foods they grow and cook. Thanks to these farmers, we've learned more about Tongan, Laos, Filipino, Thai, and Burmese cultures, and were introduced to farms that many of us had never heard of before. Mike and Sot were the very first farmers to lease land at the Pacific Gateway Farms in Kunia. My name is Saul Nyate, and then my husband is Aulai too, and then you people also call him Mike. Uh, welcome to Mingler Farm. Today, Mingler Farm occupies just under five acres of land, producing crops widely used in Southeast Asian cuisine. Mike and Saul are from Myanmar and lived very different lives until meeting later on Oahu. Mike is Mon, an indigenous ethnicity from Mon State, Myanmar, located to the east of Thailand. During the uprising in the late 1980s, Mike and his family fled their home and lived as refugees in Thailand before immigrating to the United States. In 1998, some students, you know, they have some kind of uprising or, you know, they just do something like demonstrations or strikes or something like that. They, they're afraid that, you know, they're afraid, you know, they will be arrested. So that's why they migrate to, to neighboring countries. Okay. For us, for me personally, uh, we don't do any abstract, we just stay at home. Okay. So maybe because of the cultural things, right? Boys do that kind of, you know, strikes or something. Culturally, we go still at home. We have a lot of people who are living in the world. We have a lot of people how are you like it? Come on, come on, come on. Almost every day, whenever we come, first we have to check is the the main thing is the the main thing is the seedlings and the water. You know, water something like a kind of irrigation system is okay or not. Because the uh, our lot is at the end of the irrigation system to this side. So Sometimes the other farmers, you know, the first, the, the first farmer who get or who is close to the water pump, they, they get water first. Ah. Sometimes if they use a lot and then there's not enough water in the ditch, uh -huh. so the pressure is really low in our side. Yeah. I was a teacher before, until 2007. And then after that, I, I came here for a Shop scholarship, you know, I got I got a scholarship for a few months for for one year, and then after ooh, I'm going back, I work for the UNICEF and other what is it some other nonprofit organizations, and then after that I went back, and then I applied for the student visa for the HPU. I joined the master programs at uh, HPU, Hawaii Pacific University. For me, I'm just thinking that it should be, you know, it should be so meaningful to me. So when I'm not too much, you know, too much interested in wind energy. And then later I realized that, you know, I'm just thinking that, you know, where I'm from. So 
my country, Myanmar, is the agricultural country. And uh, this is, you know, food, food is also our main, you know, life source. So. Actually, in 2014, because of the immigration status, you know, I have to go back to, to Myanmar. And then uh, I stayed over there for three years. At the time, he was working for Sushi 2. And then when, when I migrated here uh, in 2015, we wanted to start something, you know, just like all, you know, just like a kind of self-employed. And then we got the we uh, we got the announcements from the from BTC that you know there's a firm you know if we are interested so we just want to start that. For the first two years we tried organic, but the challenge is that we we don't have uh, we don't have uh, enough experience. So right now for the yeah. so so right now we 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 are okay with the with the farming because we know that what we should grow and then how you know how we should adapt you know the the changing situation. What happened at the farm is that we don't spray. This is the problem. And uh, when neighboring farmers do the pesticide spray, all the pets come in this. <laughs> You know that's okay because we just want to get the get the root right, not the leaves. That's okay. Oh, so let me. Yeah. Oh, I just need to harvest limbon grass. You put a little bit of water and every day. Not too much. Right, not too much. A little bit. Just only soak this portion, and then you put it, and then just leave it. So. When the roots are coming out a little bit like that, you can grow on, in the pot or in the soil. This is it. An exciting discovery for us at Mingler Farm was learning about banana stems, an ingredient very similar to hearts of palm. Mike harvests the hearts of young banana trees, slicing the outer layers away until he reaches the tender core. He explained that the hearts of more mature trees are also used, but that those are more suitable for cooking in soups and stews, such as Myanmar's national dish, mohinga, a soup commonly eaten for breakfast. Today we are working with the young banana stems. Mike is teaching us how to make banana stem salad, a traditional Mon dish from the region in Myanmar he grew up in. To make this dish, and then we have to chop the banana stem first into into small pieces and then we also chop the uh, fresh shallot and then to put in the dish and then after that we put the uh, fried uh, fried and garlic onion and then we put the tamarind paste and then we put uh, we put fish salt salt and then beans powder so this is an example of like when you come in as a farmer, mm -hmm. I'll take what you guys make because my, for me it's more of like I'm not Burmese, I'm not Vietnamese, I'm not Thai, mm -hmm. and those kind of things, but I know how to cook. So to me cooking is like a language, so if I can make something like this vegetarian mm -hmm. for somebody that's Burmese, like, oh yeah, remember I used to eat that when I was growing up, I had sardines in it. Mm -hmm. Oh, how do you make it taste very similar? without sardines in it. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, to me, is a language for somebody. Mm -hmm. So when I make it and they eat it and they enjoy it like they're eating it, like bringing it back to home, that makes me happy too. In the future, we hope that our farmers will be able to expand their small farm operations, get into local grocery stores, and become able to support themselves and their families independently. This program was more about teaching the farmer, like what you can make. So it, did, it doesn't make sense if like a, you're a Burmese farmer and you come in and you make like an Italian spaghetti. <laughs> to find many of the ingredients grown by Pacific Gateway farmers, visit BI Farm Stand in Chinatown on Hotel Street and Pena Farm Stand at Chinatown Marketplace on Dillingham Boulevard. On behalf of Chef Hui and Pacific Gateway Center, mahalo for supporting our local farming community.